So I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, this is the Northampton Conservation Commission meeting for the 26th of September, 2024. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, and our duties also include open space acquisition and management. We operate in a way that is consistent with open meeting law requirements. All dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask the public to limit their comments that are issued uh, or about issues that are within our purview. Today's agenda is a, a continuation of a notice of intent for a 12 unit cluster development, an access road, pedestrian paths, and related stormwater work. Uh, 8 View Avenue, uh, and then a notice of intent for open-sided pavilion, driveway and walkway construction within bordering land subject to flooding. Uh, this at Grove Food Northampton on 140 Meadow Street. Uh, we also have an emergency certification for a collapsing uh, drainage outfall out near the county jail on Route 66. Um, so I'll start with, we don't have any minutes today. Um, but are there any general public comment not having to do with the case that we're going to uh, be talking about this evening? If not, um, uh, I'll Kevin, uh, it ask. Looks like, it looks like oh, Moody there is, okay. has a hand up. Uh, I see one. Uh, yes, I, I, I do have my hand up. Pardon me? Okay. I, I'm sorry, I do have my hand up for public comment. Sorry, I, I had to get my mic on. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, Nancy Smith, Ward 2. I attended a recent meeting where a commissioner spoke to the number of abusive emails commission members received and the number of new people getting involved. I was not one of the people who wrote to you, but I was shocked by this and genuinely believe those emails were not meant for the CONCOM and more likely meant for the planning board by people unfamiliar with your work. My first CONCOM meeting was a hearing for a three house subdivision in Bay State. The builder explained casually that the possibility of basement flooding would be a low percentage and maybe a few times a year. I was so impressed with the questions and actions taken by the conservation commissioners. One asked what will happen when flooding occurs? Where will the water go when one house is pumped out? I knew the answer because I have three neighbors who've been pumping out their basements repeatedly for over 15 years. One pumps out, it goes into the next house until they pump it, and it goes to the third and back and forth until the level goes down. I do not know how these people deal with it. In this case, uh, the planning board approved, I was planning board only approval um, because it was a PB zone um, for an excavation plan that actually caused the drainage issues that just go on and on for these people. Uh, I tell this story because at that um, board meeting for, uh, Bay, I'm sorry, at that commission meeting for uh, Bay State, you asked questions and took actions to ensure that current and future residents of that neighbors will never, uh, that neighborhood will never have to deal with that. Not every board or commission, even paid ones, are willing to do that. But you have the expertise and integrity to do that for the people of this city. You did not deserve the treatment you got in those emails. I am so sorry that you were treated so poorly. The people who sent them are clearly not familiar with your work and contribution to the city. You are appreciated and respected for what you do by all those who know your work. And I am so sorry that that happened to you. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for your comments. Um, I Thank see a, another uh, Claudia Lefko. Hi, um, Claudia. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. I just have a general comment about um, the cons com in, in general, I guess, a general comment. And that is my concern that that the the decisions that are being taken are are having to be confronted by people with limited means to respond to them, i.e., people have had to raise money to to pay for an alternative or a, a, a second opinion. And I'm kind of urging you to, to, as a city body, to ask the developers to bear the cost of this second opinion and um, backing up of opinions. I realize you're a busy board and I agree with Nan that you do good work, but I also think that there's 
increasing pressure on the CONSCOM these days as everybody's beginning to take conservation in 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 consideration in every single project that goes on in the city as we should be. And so I'm just urging you to put the responsibility on the city, the city government, um, and not on the public for accuracy in these decisions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I see also Jackie Balance. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Jackie Balance from Florence. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but since Nan did, I want to say that I too have enormous respect for Kevin's personal commitment to the practice of kindness. It's nothing less than the golden rule in action. And I appreciate the reminders to be kind to one another. And I thank you, Kevin, for setting the example. And while I've got the floor, I will mention that we all saw Tuesday's Gazette article on climate change impacts that are coming around the corner. We are already seeing more heat and high, high water events, aren't we? So what's the best natural mitigator of excessive heat and high water? Is it not our already existing mature, healthy, irreplaceable trees? Is there not a tipping point of deforestation? The answer is yes. How can we as a progressive city, for example, justify using the FEMA's 1978 flood risk insurance maps to identify Northampton's floodplains? Why don't we use the current reality-based maps used by insurance companies and banks? Am I making any sense here? Mm -hmm. I know I should take this rant to the planning director or to the city council, but I feel that if the conservation commissioners would think about lobbying for some ordinance reforms that you would find helpful in your mission to protect the wetlands in the climate emergency we face, then other city officials would be more likely to listen to you. And for what it's worth, you would have public support. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Um, any other comments? If not, um, we'll... So with the first case, the notice is sent for a 12 unit cluster development at 8 View Avenue. Um, and we're we're not starting over. Let me be clear, this is a continuation, um, which often happens. And uh, we don't start over from the beginning and go over everything. So um, I will ask whoever speaks, whether it's the applicant or uh, other people uh, to not reiterate much of what they've said before, maybe a couple of highlights if that helps provide context. Uh, but really this is, we're building on what we've already heard and listened to and discussed. Um, so with that, uh, uh, is it uh, Jeff Squire, are you here yes. to present on that? I am, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so for the record, Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group here on behalf of Sovereign Builders. Um, uh, yeah, I can, share uh, share my screen, provide um, quick overview of um, of any updates and responses we've had, particularly in regards to stormwater, um, and then just answer any questions um, that the board and, and others may have. Um, I think in general, um, uh, yeah, the site plan has remained um, the same as you know as we looked at previously. Um, there obviously has been some changes to, the stormwater system in response to the comments that were uh, received. And as we, um, you know, as, a, as an office, we had an entirely different engineer take a look at that same system and reevaluate it, you know, with a new set of eyes, just, um, you know, just to be, uh, you know, responsible, uh, uh, you know, for for stormwater of this of this development. So um, that was something that we that we took on. Um, the system, um, you know, most of it had to do with the nuts and bolts of how it was modeled, the soil types, um, and and a lot of the specifics of the engineering um, internal to the system. Um, as I said, this this is an updated layout plan. This is exactly the same as it appeared last time. Um, the stormwater plan is again the the major the major change um, and update to to what we've got to present tonight. Um, and and through those comments and reevaluating this, um, you know, there were some efficiencies that were found. Um, I think that was good. You'll see that the original design, you know, this this subsurface system took up quite a bit more space. Um, so this has been, you know, in the way that it's modeled, the way that the 
pipe inverts work and, and the system um, is engineered as a whole, you know, found some efficiencies with regards to the modeling. Um, it was, um, it was, um, yeah, really dealing with the attenuation and the, um, um, and the infiltration requirements. Um, all of the other plans, as you can see, have, have um, stayed unchanged. I'll note that as a result of the changes, it also reduced some of the stormwater elements, the surface uh, detention that we had shown in this location. So some of that work um, uh, previously had encompassed a large part of this uh, buffer zone area for open surface detention area, and that has gone away. So we removed um, you know, that that work, that grading work um, will still uh, remediate the soils and remove the unsuitables that are required. Um, but that uh, that's been, you know, that's that's an improvement that resulted in in re revisiting this design. Um, I think I we we did see um, comments uh, that were submitted from the peer review um, and we were able to um, take a look at those briefly and provide some comment responses. Um, again, just understanding that this is, you know, this is really two different engineers looking at a similar project and, and having different opinions about, you know, the way it's modeled and the numbers. And so there are undoubtedly subtle nuances that are baked into somebody's opinion one way or another, but in general, um, it's, you know, the system is still largely the same. There's two main drainage areas. Um, we are treating it through a combination of uh, water quality surface units and then underground storage and then discharging to level of spreaders. Um, and as noted, we did, you know, we did have a have a fresh look at this from a different engineer that resulted in some efficiencies. Um, one of the comments that was noted in the in the recent peer review talked about the pre-development analysis. This was simply an oversight. It's this was analysis of the pre the existing drainage areas. All of that is exactly the same as it was in the, you know, that that hasn't changed at all. So it was simply an omission from the, you know, overall report, but that pre-development analysis is exactly the same as is what it was previously. Um there was a comment about uh stormwater volumes and the volumes increasing to the wetlands. And, um, you know, and, and fortunately, as is part of the stormwater standards, there's no specific standard relative to stormwater volumes. Um, as with any redevelopment or development of a site, anything that changes um, the, the uh, runoff coefficient of the surface material, whether it be, um, you know, forest to grass, grass to gravel or stone, or roof cover, um, any of those changes that increases the imperviousness of the site is going to increase volume. But the standards, as well as the Northampton standards, dictate and, and regulate the the volume or the rate of discharge off the site. So there may be a longer duration, but the rate of discharge remains the same. And so that's the standard that we need to meet and have met. Um, the modeling and detailing, as I noted, um, you know we. We we do our best to anticipate and make conservative estimates with regards to um, the the um, you know natural um, natural ecosystem the rainfall amounts um, we build in and the and the models that we use additionally build in some redundancy so there's there is a conservative approach both from a design standpoint but also from the stormwater models that we use um, again we're we will continue to to review and look at um, the uh, um, you know the conditions in the field as construction um, advances. That's not uncommon for any project that there are you know subtle changes, and as those um, as those you know instances come up, we work with the city engineering department to ensure that all of the standards are still being met and that they, you know, they often out come out and, and visit the site to ensure that the conditions that, you know, we're modeling match what we're seeing on site, whether they're what we assumed in the in the models or whether they are um, conditions that arise from, you know, changes in the field. Um, and then, then I think the only other major comment uh, that was, that was um, expressed in the peer review was, the idea of lining or putting in an impermeable liner around um, around the subsurface system. So this upper system um, here, because it is primarily for detention, and there were comments um, pertaining to uh, a mounding analysis and depth of high groundwater that 
you know, effectively, this is a line system. So we don't, this is purely a, a storage volume that we need to provide. Um, the manufacturer has a standard product that includes a lined system. We've used this on a number of uh, other projects in, in the city. Um, we've probably got a dozen of them or more um, that we've done over the last couple of years that all use the same detail, but it's a, you know, they provide a liner that comes with a system that's installed, it's inspected and um, and, and reviewed by, uh, by the manufacturer representative as it's going in. Um, and we haven't had any, any issues with that system to date. So we don't have any, you know, concerns about this being an oddball, um, uh, compilation of, 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 you know, components. So, um, otherwise I think, yeah, we will certainly provide, um, the DPW with any, you know, responses to any, uh, comments that they have. Uh, but in general, um, that's that's the update as it stands currently. Are there questions from commissioners? I have some questions, but uh, we'll see if my uh, fellow and sister commissioners have any first. I have a question. Um, uh, yes, thank you, Jeff. Uh, for that. Um, one of the questions I, I had was about the lined system. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's reassur somewhat reassuring to hear that you've successfully installed these elsewhere. Uh, I noted the conditions that were uh, described by the outside reviewer and talking about the uh, non-uniform hydrostatic pressure from below, as well as the pressure above from the parking. I believe there's parking on top of this. Right. And that the chances of that, uh, of those pressures and that shifting, uh, breaking the system essentially, so that it is no longer impervious to surrounding water, <clears throat> uh, seem to be high. And that was not addressed, I didn't see in the BGG response. Again, this the the response we put together was, you know, we had a couple of hours this afternoon to be able to fit that in, so it wasn't, sure. you know, a, an in depth response by any means. Um, I will say that, um, yeah, understanding that hydrostatic pressure and groundwater flows through here are are a consideration and a factor in in this design. Um, we do have sub drains surrounding the parking lot to help alleviate some of those pressures. Um, you know, all of that has been considered in. Um, you know, in, in the design overall, um, you know, all, this entire area where the stormwater system is, is where uh, the majority of the unsuitables from the old Market Street dumping ground were. And so, you know, part of the agreement with um, the DPW is that all of that material is going to get removed and replaced with Title V sand, which, you know, has a much greater permeability than, you know, potentially some of the material impervious that's that, that may be there now. So I think, you know, all of those things considered, we understand there's going to be groundwater flow, you know, essentially moving, you know, east to west, I guess, um, you know, in plan, um, but that there isn't going to be the opportunity for that, the amount of hydrostatic pressure to build up that would actually deteriorate this system, have an impact on this system. It's really not that deep. It's it's a fairly shallow system. Um and so, you know, there are there are ways that that groundwater can move through and around this that that system without pushing it up or or impacting its ability to you know perform structurally. So it was my understanding that part of the concern was that it's an uneven water table there, and so that the hydrostatic pressure would not be consistent across the the, the lower surface of the storage. I mean, this, the area that this consumes is probably 30 by 60 feet. I just, I just guessing. And mm -hmm. so I, the variability of the hydrostat, the groundwater in that small footprint is, I, I don't know what that is. I don't anticipate that it's that significant. Um, you know, it's, it's 180 square, 200 square feet. Um, maybe there's some variability due to the subsurface conditions that exist. Um, the 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 material that's there, but again, we're going to stabilize all that with new material that gets brought in. So I don't anticipate there's going to be that unevenness, at least where you know any of the paving exists, certainly, and or where the stormwater systems exist because of the conditions that we need to provide um, for for the for the to meet the standards. Okay, 
Okay, thanks. I, I guess uh, the kind of underlying question I had that I didn't express is, are the other systems that you've installed successfully in, in the area, are they in a similar setting? Any of them in a similar, with a um, uh, groundwater? Um, yes. Under a parking lot? Yep. Um, the most recent one is actually off of William Street. Uh, 107 mm -hmm. Williams, which is a, you know, another uh, sort of info of this that wasn't um, subject to the um, Northampton mm -hmm. water permit because it was under an acre, but we have a, a parking lot over a very similar system to this that is a line system. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's functioned extremely well. And I think it was in early this spring, even when we got some of those heavy rains um, and, but we haven't had any issues. Okay, thanks. Can I follow up with a similar question? Who's speaking? Um, Jeff, have you? Uh, this is Paul Foster Moore. Mm -hmm. Hi, Paul. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Uh, do we know what these systems are like ten years down the road after installation? Do they hold up? Sure. I mean, I, I, we're using manufacturers that have a reputation and have products that have been, you know, tested in not only this state, but in multiple, you know, states across the country. Um, you know, we, we rely on their, their testing and their data to, you know, to select, um, you know, something that we're comfortable with, but it's this, these, these products, these systems that we're, we're proposing are certainly, um, have certainly got a history of of performing well, and and you know is the reason that we've we've looked at these as as options for this project. Okay. I guess one of the questions that that uh, raises is if a, a component like this should fail at some point in the future, what's the uh, warranty period that that manufacturer provides? Uh, uh, right. to uh, affirm its continued performance? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a complicated question. Um, I guess the, the simple answer is there's there's going to be a number of warranties and guarantees that are going to be part of the construction process, um, whether it be, you know, uh, a means and methods thing or whether it be a, a materials, you know, question. There's going to be warranties for for the work, for the installation. There's going to be warranties for the product. So there's there's going to be a number of warranties in place to ensure that the product and the and the system as it's designed functions correctly. And then there's going to be a number of other assurances, you know, as part of the permit and the stormwater permit that will require this system to function as it was designed or you know, it's on the developer to to correct, and it'll be up to the developer to decide where you know where those costs are incurred. But um, you know, if there's a system failure, then um, you know that's something that will be a cost to him to correct, and um, we'll have to work through that with you know whoever's responsible. Other questions from commissioners, Mason. Yeah, and I did notice another uh, difference on this plan. In the original one that was the line of stone barriers or markers uh, that we asked for and show on the plan uh they certainly should be there if they are not they uh, are uh, yes that's what i'm saying that was the difference that i noticed yes they're there on the plan well yeah. small change but big for us Um, I also had a question about the, uh, the, the gutters and the drainage system, uh, from mm -hmm. the boots and, yeah. uh, the third yeah. the outside reviewers comments about, uh, not being included in the operations and management mm -hmm. and with no clean outs, no points of inspection and no diagram. There are certainly a number of locations that will have access for cleanouts. There's, you know, the stormwater system has got, this one's got four ports. This one's got at least two, if not four. Um, you know, there are going to be sections of, you know, pipe run that, you know, are going to be inaccessible just by function of what they are. Um, every downspout that drops into the ground is going to be a location uh, to access that pipe. Um, 
it's not going to be a you know there isn't going to be a continuous pipe connection from the from the gutter all the way down to through the ground so there'll be an access point at the ground um it's yeah i mean there debris and gutters is an issue in new england that's that's just the way it is and so um there's going to be responsibility on the homeowners built into the you know the um, homeowners association that requires them to upkeep maintenance or whether that will be a, a maintenance requirement of the um, of the development that can certainly be you know a condition that can be added I don't see any issue with that that will be part of the general upkeep of um, of you know whatever whatever association whatever landscape maintenance happens with this site so I don't see that being an issue um, but yeah insofar as you know access and and ability to clean those systems like I said, there'll be access at ground level around at all those locations. There is an operation and maintenance plan for the subsurface system that does, does anticipate some of that debris to collect in portions of that system. And so that's why that operation and maintenance plan suggests vacuuming it out and jet spraying it and cleaning, you know, cleaning out those collection points on an annual basis. And so that's all been part of the operation and maintenance plans for the, the larger system. But um, there is certainly going to be you know, some responsibility of the homeowner and then the association to, you know, sort of maintain basic upkeep of these units as any other, you know, household in New England. Thank you. Other questions from commissioners? I have one, but I'll, I'll wait till others have a chance to talk. <laughs> Well, I have a couple deriving from Mr. Gemma's uh, report, but I'll, I'll I'll say first that uh, Mr. Gemma asserted some things that are are not accurate. Uh, he uh, started with asserting that peer reviews are uh, quite common, and and that's true for towns that don't have in-house expertise, uh, where the conservation commission needs to rely on a third party uh, to get that kind of input. We're fortunate in Northampton. Um, he, he repeatedly refers to Northampton as a town, so that may be part of the source of yeah. his misunderstanding, um, that in Northampton, we actually have stormwater expertise within DPW. Um, and so that that is something that not every community has. Uh, he also uh, uh, ref says that, quote unquote, town authorities did not bother to review the submission, quote unquote, and that's just not true. Um, huh. It was reviewed and commented on, and uh, changes resulted. Uh, so uh, that that's that's just not accurate. Um, and he further stated that um, amendments to the plan were made based on his input. Most of those changes were actually from DPW's input. He had been looking at an earlier version of the plan, uh, so he brought up some of the points, the same points uh, that DPW had brought up, because as I say, we have in-house expertise. So uh, those modifications to the plan had already been underway as a response to DPW's input. So I wanted to be clear that uh, Mr. Gemma was working with some misunderstandings as he approached this. Nonetheless, I want to take seriously some of the issues that he raised. Um, he says that he has interpolated uh, groundwater uh, from various uh, test pits and therefore estimating the level of groundwater uh, in various places where this subsurface stormwater system is going to be built. Um, and that he thinks that, quote unquote, it is probable that there will be places where it does not meet the two foot separation requirement uh, right. from the bottom of the system to the uh, top of uh, mean annual high groundwater. Uh, can you address that uh, question? Yeah. Sure. Um, so at least, oops, I'm sorry. Um, the the two systems that require this this system here is a line system, so it doesn't rely on doesn't doesn't require that same separation. This system, uh, we do have a test pit directly below it that was done earlier this year um, that does satisfy the separation requirement. Um, the only other location that there is a subsurface system is is right here. Um, this is, you know, a very small system. There was a test pit that was dug um, prior to the design, you know, roughly nine, 10 feet away at a lower elevation. Um, we use that groundwater elevation. This system, again, due to its size and, and location being up gradient, we were 
he felt that this was a conservative, you know, estimation um, as part of the stormwater permit. We've got to confirm those groundwater elevations when these holes are actually dug in the field. Um, so if there is any variation, again, just referring to my comment before about, you know, addressing, um, you know, unforeseen circumstances or, or issues that come up during construction that if for some reason groundwater is higher in this location, um, we'll work with the DPW in the city to adjust the system so that it conforms to the standards. But those are the only two locations where um, groundwater um, separation is is required and needed in in regards to the stormwater system. Thank you, um, uh, uh, Mr. Jimmel. Also stated that pipe size and uh, diameter were not specified um, on the plans, um, and therefore the the ability of the design to convey the volume that's anticipated was uh, not reliably. Um, uh, articulated. Th th can you address that? Um, I guess I would question exactly which pipes he's, I mean, I, you can see here, there's a number of eight inch, six inch, 10 inch, eight. Um, you know, we've got all of these sizes called out. Um, you know, if we missed, if we missed a segment, um, you know, again, we've got to provide, I'm just sort of browsing through this as we go through, but you can see a lot of these are called out. Um, if there's a section that was missed and requires clarification, um, that will certainly surface as we submit final construction drawings to the DPW. But um, yeah, I'm not seeing that there's any major drainage pipes that are, that are not included here. All right, thank you. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, for my questions built off of Mr. Jemis' report, he made two recommendations that he thought would actually be better than the existing plan. Uh, one was using a, above surface rain gardens and so forth, uh, yeah. uh, open air um, uh, uh, water mm -hmm. systems rather than the subsurface systems. Um, I imagine you considered that. What, can you address that question? Uh, sure. Yeah. I, you know, as with any project, it's, it's trying to combine the feasibility of a project combined uh, as well as the economics of it. So, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of, um, you know, units that need to get developed to make the project even viable. Um, and so, you know, we did look at, you know, <laughs> what it would take to manage the stormwater from this, from a project like this or similar to this on the surface. Um, and again, that, you know, if it's a surface system, it needs to be the bottom of that system needs to be two feet above high groundwater. So it would have resulted in a large, you know, pond in this northern corner and loss of one, two, three, four, probably five or six, you know, units anyway. Um, and so it just that at, at that point, it just doesn't make economic sense to to pursue a project. Um, you know, the amount of stormwater that's required to manage, you know, that type of development on the surface with all the standards that needs to be met is, is, you know, pretty extensive, which is why we, you know, most projects now utilize subsurface systems that are a lot more efficient. Um, and so, yeah, we, we certainly did look at it, uh, but it, again, just the, the space requirements for that type of system are, are, you know, far greater than what we have uh, proposed in this system. And, and uh, he also suggested that uh, the paved areas might be, uh, pervious uh, mm -hmm. pavers of some kind. Um, we've in the past had experience where uh, they, after a couple of years, are no longer pervious. Um, mm -hmm. And so we generally, generally don't consider them to be um, maintainable as pervious surfaces. But uh, can you address that question as well, since he brought it up? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, and I think I I think it was uh, porous asphalt is was what I recall in his his recommendations, which you know is a slightly different material. We have started to use that and recommend that on a lot of projects recently. Um, you know, the challenges obviously with this site are high groundwater um, and the poor soils, and um, you know, part of the challenge with the porous asphalt is that it requires a much depth, uh, much greater uh, cross section. Um, you know, it's it, rather than a, a, a 12 foot, you know, gravel base under asphalt, it's it's generally around a, a two foot uh, profile that includes layers of stone and, and uh, sand material. 
And so, and then the bottom of that, um, again, dealing with that groundwater separation component, the bottom of that profile then needs to be two feet above seasonal high groundwater. And so on this site in particular, it, it's it's a challenging site to, to do that. We did consider it um, initially, but it just, it wasn't a feasible option here because it wouldn't, um, you know, we, we wouldn't, we would have been in groundwater in, in some locations. But that's a, and this is tangential to this particular application, but so you have had successful experience with some uh, yes. pervious pavement technology. So yeah. well, it's good to know this, uh, that offline, I'll be interested to find out uh, more about that because in the years past, we have found those to be only <laughs> pervious for a couple of years and they get mad at well, him and the, the maintenance is overbearing and, and it's yeah. not realistic. So I suspect sure. that there's better technology that I am at least so far not familiar with. Thank you. And it's becoming more common, I think, which is the other benefit is that, you know, maintenance is a little bit more attainable now than it used to be. It wasn't such an anomaly that, you know, it's a little yeah. bit more common to be able to do that. So, yes, but we yes. did look at it. Other questions from commissioners? Well, Kevin, you anticipated a couple of mine um, <clears throat> looking at Gemma's report, and I just wanted to go back to the potentially open air above grade um, stormwater disposal system. Uh, he asserts that if the uh, building, some of them, the single family units were consolidated into attached units, it would create space for such a system. And I was wondering what your take on that was, Jeff. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different type of project, I suppose. It's, you know, the I think the development goals with this project were to, to, build, you know, small, efficient, single family units that, you know, as opposed yep. to a duplex, um, you know, it's a slightly different market. They're, you know, ultra small. So sharing those spaces with, you know, with um, a, a, an adjacent party wall, I can, I can understand is, um, yeah. you know, a marketing decision <laughs> that I can't really speak to. Um, yep. So nope. yeah, I just, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of things that have been posed and looked at, uh, proposed and looked at on this site. Um, but this is, this is what we're, we're tasked with at the moment. Great. Um, the other question I had, is, uh, there are certain numbers, um, by Gemma that I wonder if, are they credible? Uh, because he, you know, in addressing the, the requirement for a minimum of two feet between the seasonal high uh, groundwater table, mm -hmm. um, and the bottom of the operation system, it looks like he says that there's one point. Uh, five feet to 1.8 feet minimum clearance. And I don't know what to make of that. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a specific location. Um, and again, that that system, the, the line system is, is, you know, that may be closer than two feet because of, you know, of, of what it needs to, um, uh, for what its functions are from an engineering standpoint. Um, but, you know, at least in so far as the, the subsurface system that does infiltrate, um, that, you know, those elevations really haven't changed at all. Um, uh -huh. And so, you know, again, just looking at a, sort of a basic cross section through through that area there, I'm not, I mean, we've got to satisfy that two feet of separation. So I'm not sure, yeah, where he's referring to. Well, okay. my, uh, and my thought, Paul, is that when I read through that, I had the same reaction, but then I read it carefully, and he says he's interpolating among different other test pits, so he's not actually asserting that it is there, and then he uses the term probable, uh, that there yep. may be some areas that are less than two feet, so uh, I yep. think he was yep. just expressing a concern rather than an actual assertion. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, the other thing I was wondering about is, is there, he asserts that there's a, a distinct possibility of a lot of standing water just um, building up in the bordering vegetative wetlands. And again, is that to be um, taken seriously? I, I don't know what to make of that comment. Um, yeah, I mean, I it's if you've been back in these wetlands um, and are familiar with yeah. those, that's it's yeah. sort of a um, you know, there's a lot of uh, hummocks and and sort of little you know low points and depressions. Right. It all does eventually grade to that river, um, that stream corridor, 
on, on the you know the west side, which does have an outlet. It all does flow to an outlet. So there's there may be and you know absolutely is wetter periods where you know there are periods of standing water that are higher than others. Certainly now is a very low period. In the spring, it was it was much higher. Um, but all that does, you know, eventually make its way to an outlet um, and and is controlled in, in some ways. So I, you know, all I can say is that all of that is down gradient. There is a, a drainage, um, you know, a, a destination that is down gradient from, you know, most of this area, most of the area behind the homes. You know, that's the reason why it's a, it's, it's a stream corridor and the drainage, you know, um, basin that it is. Um, but right. yeah, we, I don't, you know, I don't doubt that there will be periods of standing water back here, um, but they should be short in nature and and certainly seasonal in nature. I would anticipate. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners or comments? Can we talk a little bit about plants? <laughs> Um, I, I'm wondering about, um, our brief discussion last time about dealing with invasives, any plans for that? And you said that there weren't plans to deal with that other than where the, uh, buildings would be constructed mm -hmm. and, uh, where the development actually is. Um, and also about, we had, some folks had mentioned last time, uh, some plantings that might, uh, be more uh, absorbent, greater uptake of water, such as willows or pawpaws. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so oh, I guess just a couple of the with respect to the invasives. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, anywhere the development is, is proposed, um, all of that is going to be, you know, is going to be completely removed um, in its entirety. Um, I think there will certainly be. Um, you know, removal of invasives uh, just on the outer fringes, particularly where we're proposing, you know, plantings. It's 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 most significant, um, at least on the hanging on the existing trees, bittersweet and those at the at that forest edge where there's some sunlight. Um, once you get into the site, um, you know, I would say from my recollection, the predominant Invasives back there are um, are euonymus, uh, burning bush. There's a lot of barberry. Um, there's certainly some garlic mustard um, and um, uh, bittersweet isn't quite as prevalent back there because of the lack of sunlight. Uh, most of that is at the edges, you know, along the railroad or the bike path um, at the backs of the yards. Um, but it is, you know, I, I would just say that it is throughout that entire area because of its previous disturbance. Um, we did talk with SWCA about formulating a, um, you know, invasives plan for that entire property, and um, it it very quickly got pretty extensive. And the 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 ability to effectively eradicate, you know, all those invasives in that wetland was, you know, just it's it's just not practical, um, you know, without completely, you know, stripping that vegetation um, or you know without multiple herbicide applications a year and um I, so i you know we we did talk about it um we certainly considered if it was you know a viable option i don't you know it it was a twenty thousand dollar plan to put together plus you know then years of you know multiple maintenance that you know may or may not be effective um so i think at least insofar as you know the current proposal is to certainly eradicate and deal with all the invasives in the areas of development on the fringes of, you know, the existing woodland and where we're proposing plantings, but, um, you know, deep into the wetland on the western part of the site that we're not touching, um, it just, it just wasn't a, a you know, feasible um, aspect to the project that we could consider, I think. If there have been other yeah. uh, uh, cases okay. where uh, the Conservation Commission has organized uh, with our uh, partners um, volunteer efforts to go into areas and try to maintain some uh, either clean out of trash or uh, maintain some kind of uh, 
of attention to getting rid of uh, invasives, uh, but it's a, a it is always and inevitably a um, an uphill battle. Uh, the invasives are there because they're really good at being there. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, it's my um, understanding that uh, the project is only going to take up about 20% of the acreage, leaving the other 80% undisturbed? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the other the other thing I note, I would note just because um, it was something that was brought up previously, um, is just the amount of uh, tree removal on the site and deforestation. Um, you know, where this project is on the on the eastern portion of the site, um, you know, conservative estimates that I were, was looking at today, there's only about 16 percent of the overall forested canopy that's being removed. And I would say probably a, a two thirds of that is is the Norway spruce. Just as, right. a, Which as is a the, reference, the remainder is, is completely, you know, is untouched. Yeah. And then the Norway spruce is non-native and correct. the, the to replace trees with native plants, right? Right. Yeah. And I'll uh, I'll add that on Google Earth, uh, you can do a thing where you drop pins around the perimeter of an area, and it'll tell you what the square area you've just enclosed is. So with a maximum zoom in on the uh, trees that are scheduled to be removed um, compared to the entire site. Uh, the entire, I, I did it a couple of ways. I did the entire forested site, which goes across the bike path and across uh, Bradford and uh, it's a larger area. Um, and in that case, the part that's going to be uh, cut, the, the trees that are going to be cut down uh, was about 2% of the current area. If you just restricted it to the current owned parcels that are part of this, um, uh, this project, uh, it's about 5%. And the replacement uh, foliage within uh, the estimates we hear are less than a decade uh, will have recovered uh, the tree canopy. So it's maintaining somewhere between uh, 95 and 98% of the tree cover. Um, so it's a, uh, mm. mo mo most, right. of the, no. most of the canopy is, is uh, going to remain intact. Other questions from commissioners? And I'll also remind people that the applicant has uh, committed to grant a um, protection to a uh, little over half of the uh, total parcel with a conservation restriction right. in perpetuity. So that's uh, also uh, because there are potentially ways, it wouldn't be easy, but there are potentially ways that development could happen elsewhere if uh, an applicant could do demonstrate proper re replication, et cetera. Um, but now that would be taken off the table as a future possibility. Mm. Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, questions or comments from members of the public? Um, and I will remind members of the public uh, to address the commission, um, not the applicant. Um, and I will also ask members of the public, if you spoke last time, your comments are both recorded and on the record, and you don't need to say the same thing over again. Uh, but if you have something new, by all means, speak up. <laughs> so. Three minutes. Yes, and if there's a number of people, I'll have to try and keep it to the three minute uh, uh, public hearing tradition in Northampton. But I, I don't know right now how many people want to speak, but. I see uh, Jacqueline. Hi, uh, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. All right, great, thank you. Jacqueline McCraner, Northampton. Mm -hmm. um, this comment about being able to replace the tree canopy is pretty ludicrous to me. Um, the 27 significant Norway spruce trees that are on the chopping block for this project are completely irreplaceable. Whatever is getting planted will not reach the height, the diameter, the habitat giving benefits that the current trees provide. 
and they will not um, be uh, absorbing up to 150 gallons of water in the ground per day per tree that these trees provide. So I would just like to uh, make that note. And also Norway spruce trees are uh, providing habitat for birds of all kinds, including birds of prey, um, due to the disease, I don't know if it's woolly aphid or whatever it is called, um, that is affecting our hemlock trees. So oh, Nor Norway spruce trees are um, providing habitat for you know the decline of the hemlock trees for the species that use the hemlock trees and won't be able to have those trees. Hmm. Um, Commissioner Lake said that uh, Mr. Gemma was using a outdated version or an early version of the uh, permit plan set. I believe um, his first peer review was based on the July 17th permit plan set for the project at Eight View Avenue. And I believe that that was the, the latest, most up-to-date revision of the permit, uh, permit plan set before um, the applicant shared the September 20th uh, permit plan set. So I don't think that the actual plans were outdated. Um, there have been flooding issues at 29 Sherman Avenue, which I believe is a sovereign builders project, which is not far from the Eight View Avenue project. I don't know what kind of storm system was used there, but um, there has been reported increased flooding in that neighborhood since uh, 29A through E Sherman Avenue was constructed. And um, another comment that I have is that it is extremely disrespectful to Northampton residents and the abutters of 8 View Avenue to submit revised plans and reports a few days before a hearing when it is well known that the abutters stormwater consultant, Mr. Gemma of Metro West Engineering is reviewing the plans that were discussed at the previous hearing on September 12th. Even more so because we inquired to Ms. LaVallee whether this would happen and she never replied. Northampton residents have spent a great deal of our- 30 seconds, please. A great you've gone over the You've gone over the three minutes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we've spent a great deal of our own money on a third party review, which should have been required by the commission and paid for by the applicant for 8 View Avenue. My last two sentences. The fact that multiple peer reviews have been needed is evident by the multiple rounds of plan and calculation revisions performed by the applicant's engineer in response to our third party review. I've also heard the commissioners talking a lot about Mr. Gemma's reports tonight. Uh, this process has been patently unfair to the project abutters. Thank you, uh, Adam Cohen. Hi, I'm Adam Cohen from North Street. I <clears> have <throat> a couple questions uh, that Mr. Jonas suggested that uh, we, the neighbors, pose to the commission. First question is, stormwater management approach for the proposed 12-unit housing infill development project for Eight View has changed drastically since the notice of intent was submitted to the Massachusetts DEP. Have revised plans and analysis been provided to the DEP for their review and comment? The second question is, Similarly, the plans and analysis for Northampton stormwater permit are also much different than those at the time of the application. So we'd like to clarify if a new application has been filed. That was my question. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, Sarah, do you want to comment on the DEP part of uh, uh, Mr. Cohen's question? Uh, sure. So DEP does provide an initial review and comments to the commission. Uh, those are available in the staff report and are also included in the project file on OpenGov. Um, they do receive supplemental plan sets, but typically do not do a, another revision. That's not something the DEP does. Uh, and regarding the stormwater permit, um, DPW has been reviewing the revised materials that have been submitted but an application for a, uh, an amended permit will need to happen prior to construction. Thank you both. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cohen, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, Meg Robbins. 
<clears throat> Sorry, I always go through the unmute thing. Thank you. Um, I also have a couple of questions and I appreciate um, the sharing of the update of report tonight, but um, the questions really kind of balance on that and really make me think further about what more I think residents would like to know. Um, one question is that the applicant's own engineering report states that the project will increase the volume of water into the wetland by 30%. Northampton Residence Commissioned hyd Hydrology Expert, Mr. Gemma, has determined that this may alter the wetland hydrology. Will the commission engage their own wetland hydrologist to, hydrologist to assess the project impacts? This is really fundamentally important to everybody, not only in this neighborhood, but on that, uh, anything that has the knock-on impact that goes on, it would be really great to be able to hear from an additional wetland hydrologist report on this, given the um, delicacy of this particular site. And then my second question is, um, and we heard a little bit about this today in terms of the retention, will the commission require sovereign buildings to look at alternative methods to manage the stormwater on site at 8 View Avenue and I'm curious, you did ask a question about the failure rate and the potentials that were mentioned, but um, could we have actual data about how the failure rate might be on that and ones that would be easier and possibly um, easier to maintain as well? Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I can answer about the, uh, as I said, small towns often have uh, third party reviews because they don't have the expertise in house. Northampton is fortunate to have the expertise in house. The Northampton uh, Stormwater Ordinance states uh, that it has to require a stormwater permit has to require that new development, redevelopment, and land disturbance activities maintain the natural hydrologic characteristics of the land. Um, so that issuing a stormwater permit uh, from our uh, city DPW stormwater expert is asserting that it will maintain the natural hydrologic characteristics of the land. The state laws that describe um, uh, rate of flow, uh, the, that we you can't have huge increases in the rate of flow, but you can have increases in the total volume as long as the rate does not increase, because that'll give the wetland a chance to absorb as it normally does. Um, uh, the water coming into it. So it's the rate of flow that uh, uh, we have to consider. Um, I'll can, move can, on I just, to... can I just follow up on that for a quick question then, which is how do we know what the rate of flow will be given the enormous climate changes that have happened? So we've had enormous amounts of water that have happened this year, and it might be worse next year. And we can probably consider it will increasingly be worse. And I, I guess that's a real concern of residents. So I understand. I understand, I, I understand that concern. And if uh, we have a stormwater expert asserting that the post-development uh, hydrologic conditions of this site will be equivalent to the pre-development hydrologic conditions of this site, then if we have a lot more climate in, uh, change induced heavy rains, whether we build this project or not, the impact will be roughly the same. And that wetland scientist is? The, D the DPW expert, there's a couple of, of uh, stormwater engineer experts at DPW. So can I just ask you to consider the possibility in this case, um, it, given residents enormous concern to consider a third party expert, just to, to lay fears at rest and to know that we're really doing our best to make this project um, you know, efficient. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. As, as I've said to other people, we've gotten the feedback from DEP at the state level. We've got a couple of engineers at the city level uh, within DPW. We've had the uh, consultants of the applicant, and we've heard uh, from Mr. Gemma um, that I don't think we need uh, another expert. We've had a lot of experts weighing in on this all the way along from the beginning. And I'll also comment that it is normal and um, almost invariable that plans change based on feedback. 
um, that the pushback and feedback that Sarah gives for initial following filings, the feedback from the DEP, the feedback from DP, these things are dynamic uh, and the plans change in order. And you know the changes are almost invariably improvements and we're glad for that. We want that to be that kind of process. So it's not unusual that plans continue to change. The only time they're fixed is when we close the hearing. And then those are the plans that the commission has to vote on. Um, I'll move on to uh, Ruthie Woodring. Uh, she may not be at her screen. I'll move on to Jackie Balance. Thank you, uh, Jackie Balance from Florence. So, um, forgive me for harping on climate, the climate emergency, but city council declared a climate emergency twice. And I don't see us taking the emergency measures. I don't even know what the emergency measures should be. But Global Science, as well as the Daily Hampshire Gazette article, agree that we're in for more and more high water events. If the volume of water being released into the wetland from this project is being increased, and significantly so, regardless of the rate of flow, how can the Conservation Commission assure downstream residents in abutters that they will not suffer from flooding and property damage? The logic is that existing wetlands have an ability to absorb a certain rate of uh, incoming water. And as long as the post development uh, uh, after the project has been built, the rate of flow is the same, then the wetlands will logically continue to be able to absorb that rate of flow. Okay. Because of the permeability. The, the, the various uh, characteristics of, of the wetland. So uh, as if, if uh, anyway, that that's that's the, the logic behind that principle is that a wetland is capable of a certain rate of absorption. So if you don't increase the rate of income, uh, incoming water, then uh, the wetland ought to be able to absorb it the way it has in the past. And as I said before, if no project was done here, the, the new climate change induced increases in uh, rain would be a factor. This won't uh, make that fact better or worse. Uh, this is uh, keeping the rate of flow the same and therefore um, the ability of the wetland to absorb. If there were to be, because of additional um, huge, and I'm not a, a wetlands um, scientist that can answer this question, is there a point at which existing wetlands will be overwhelmed by uh, uh, the climate change induced rainfall? And the, the answer may be yes, but this project won't make that any better or any worse. I'll move on to uh, Tom Riddell. No, maybe not. Thanks, uh, thank Kevin. Oh, yeah. yes, okay. Um, okay, thanks. Um, uh, I'm a Northampton resident in a historically low-lying area, subject to uh, a lot of water flow, storm water Do, flow. Can you say your address, please? Yeah, I live on Aldridge Street. Although you're the first, I'm the first person you've asked for their address. Um, well, normally, people, other people have said their addresses mostly, okay. not everybody. Um, I admit to not having read all the files in this submission submission, but my motivation is a concern as a resident about increasing stormwater incidents and managing stormwater runoff throughout Northampton. I'm not an expert, but this is beginning to seem a little bit like a rush job. I know it's not. People have been working on it for a long time, but what's happened recently, um, I was interested in uh, why the um, September 20th submission from Berkshire Design Group. Uh, um, I, I was, I, I read through it. I wondered why it was revised, um, a summary of the changes and why they changed. And I appreciated Jeff Squire's presentation 
and the um, showing of the 926 letter um, answering some of those questions. I saw it on my screen, but I couldn't read it, and it was only there momentarily. Um, in the report, the Vernal Pool report is an appendix, um, and it's from 2008. And I wonder whether the concerns about wetlands and vernal pools hasn't changed since then. Um, I'll echo others' concerns about increasingly obvious irrelevance and inappropriateness of references to and reliance on the 1978 FEMA flood maps. Um, and then my question is, um, and in some sense, it may be rhetorical, given what um, Kevin Lake's already said. The engineering plans and calculations submitted thus far for the proposed project have contained numerous errors and omissions. Will the Northampton Conservation Commission agree to have an independent expert paid for by the applicant to review any future submittals? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jan Myers, I'm, I'm not sure of the order. I see other hands up. Let's start with Jan Myers. Hi, uh, thank you, Kevin. My name is Jane Myers, 74 Straw Avenue in Florence. Some of this might be a little bit um, repetitious, but I'm wondering why the applicant's consultant, the landscape architect from Berkshire Design Group, why it is he who's presenting details of the stormwater plan and analysis to the Northampton Conservation Commission and the Northampton public? Of course, in the Commonwealth of the law, as well as the Mass DEP, require drainage plans and analyses to be prepared by a professional engineer. It's clear that the representative for Berkshire Design Group does not understand either the analysis or the function of the system and having him, rather than the engineer, who stamped the work, present the design to the public and answers questions with confidence and accuracy wastes everyone's time. It also constitutes malpractice as presenting a stormwater plan to the public according to 250, the 250 Code of Massachusetts Regulations is the same as designing it and represents the practice of engineering. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ruthie Woodring. <laughs> All right, thanks, I'm sorry I couldn't find my unmute button before. Um, I'm Ruthie Woodring, I live in Florence most of the time, but Saturdays I live on Northern Avenue um, where I do the bike lab, which is a bike fixing workshop free and open to the public. Um, bikes, tools, basements, floods, it's always been a challenging situation and kind of depends on a sump pump. Um, yeah, I feel like human beings are always trying to control water, but water is very, very powerful and it'll, it will outlive all of our technological tricks. So maybe we're better off trying to live in harmony with it. When I heard about some of the ways to um, deal with the water, this new development, if, to me, it kind of feels like it's dependent on this technology with the barriers or the homeowners cleaning things out, things that might or might not happen or that eventually, at some point, eventually, they will fail. Um, but what I really care about more than the rusty bikes and stuff is the trees and the animals' homes. Um, so I did want to respond to the one comment about whatever percentage of tree cover, whether it's 20% or 2%, 2% of the deforestation of a larger area, but it's 100% of this area. Um, um, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Um, and since I was the one who brought up the percentages uh, based on Google Maps, I'll say that of the owned land, these two parcels that the uh, uh, sovereign builder um, is now building on one portion of, uh, it looks like about 5% of canopy is going to be removed and replaced uh, with uh, other canopy that will grow in place. It'll take a while, but um, uh, it's not removing a huge percentage of the canopy. Um, uh, uh, Michael Kane. Um, thank you, Michael Kane, uh, 12 Garfield Ave in Florence. Um, just wondering if the commission uh, hearings for this project are continued um, because of some of the, the issues that were raised tonight. 
Um, will the commission agree that future hearings will provide for at least several weeks period before a hearing to allow residents, uh, experts to review any subsequent materials? I think that there's been some issue about the, the, the lack of time for, for professional and, uh, and uh, review, and we would just like more time to review um, so that we can be more prepared. Thank you. Um, that's a, uh, a question for city council. Um, we, uh, uh, we, we receive applications and once we have the information available, we um, proceed with, we, we give feedback, uh, DPW gives feedback, state gives feedback. Um, and once the application is approaching some level of completeness, um, we move forward with it. If uh, a citizen group decides that they want also to participate in that process, they are welcome to. Um, but uh, I, there is no mechanism by which we can say, oh, we have to build in a couple of extra months so that people have a right, uh, 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 an amount of time that they think is adequate uh, to go through things. We, we go through the things. Um, if anybody else wants to go through them, they're more than welcome. Kevin, I would add as well that the commission, once an applicant is submitted, is bound by the, the timelines provided in 310 CMR, the Wellness Protection Act regulations. Um, so there, there is not typically the luxury to be able to require an applicant to submit revised plans, which do happen in almost every project. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, there's not, there's often not the luxury to allow in even a, a week or two to review those before the commission bumps up against the, the timeline by which they they have to act either to issue a permit or to deny one. This case was a little bit different in that initially the, the applicant uh, agreed to waive those timelines. Any other questions or comments from members of the public? If not, uh, any last questions or comments from other commissioners? If not, uh, someone yeah, I do have a motion? comment. Okay, Mason, go ahead. Um, DEP is certainly aware of this climate change problem, and as such, are um, reviewing and adjusting the Wetlands Act to allow for this. Um, I'm anticipating that later on we ourselves will adjust our own ordinance. Uh, keep up with DEP as far as their uh, review and uh, redoing of the weapons. And I will add that although now retired, Mason for decades was an uh, uh, environmental consultant with expertise in stormwater management. So uh, uh, this is also one of those cases where the commission also has people who are literate in exactly this kind of stuff. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners? If not, uh, someone want to make a motion to close the hearing? Or is there a commissioner who feels like we need additional information and additional time and therefore should make a motion to continue? Um, uh, I would move that we close the hearing. Is there a motion, mo motion uh, to close made by Paul? Is there a second? Paul okay. second. Second by Beth. Uh, made and seconded to close the hearing. Any further discussion? If not, uh, all in favor. Uh, roll call, Sarah. Roll call. Roll Paul? Yes. Mason? Yes. Melissa? Sorry, yes. I was clicking on the wrong thing. Yes. Uh, Beth? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Yeah. All right. We uh, are now closed uh, in our hearing. Um, and as members of the public may or may not know, uh, we, the commissioners, can't discuss any of this with each other until now, um, and, until uh, uh, we're in uh, the, the public eye. Um, so I don't. I really don't know how my other uh, fellow and sister commissioners are thinking about um, any of this stuff. Um, but I'll open that up for uh, comments first to uh, see what people are thinking. And 
Um, let, let, let's hear. I have uh, my own thoughts, some of which uh, have no doubt leaked out in some of my earlier comments already this evening. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, well, I, 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 go ahead. Go ahead, Melissa. Uh, I think Melissa, were you about to talk? Yeah, go sorry. I was I was just gonna say that I, I think that, that idea that with or without this project, the wetlands are gonna get hammered by uh potentially uh huge deluges due to climate change. And I think that all in all, this the uh, whole project represents an improvement um, for that property. And, uh, you know, it's it's hard to cut down trees, um, but it is a small percentage of the, of the uh, forest stand there. And I'm confident that the uh, wildlife can adapt to that. And especially as new trees, native species come into their full canopies, um, hopefully within a decade. And I would just hope that uh, some of these trees could be really water absorbed and uh, that uh, care would be taken to include such uh, species on the uh, the planting list. I think I generally agree with, with your, that perspective, Paul. I think that like part of what I think the we should issue conditions around the success of some of the plantings and sort of making sure that those actually take and 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 are going to be established. And I think yes. that the invasive species removal is also important because I think that speaks directly to the value of the the land that's going to be um, the the conservation easement. Um, but otherwise, I think I I think I generally am pretty comfortable with the. The, the plan. Beth, does that mean that you would support the applicant spending $20,000 to remove the invasives? Uh, um, I, I think that the invasive removal around the, in the areas like near the, near the buildings, I think are the most important having, I mean, my memory on the site was that was the area where they were the worst too being there and so i'm i mean it would be wonderful to have no invasives on anywhere in the property but i also just don't think that's realistic and I, I don't think that that would necessarily be reasonable for us to to request um so yeah. i'm yeah i'm i'm more talking about what's the what the, what's in the plan that they're already good other thoughts comments from commissioners My own um, thoughts are that uh, this is a, a plan that uh, our own DPW stormwater experts have certified uh, as they are required to do in issuing a stormwater permit that the post-development condition of this area will not be uh, any worse than it will maintain the hydrologic characteristics of the pre-development uh, uh, yep. parcel. Um, that in addition, the, the, the stormwater system that's been designed here, right now, all the water sheet flows into uh, the wetland with no treatment. Um, the new system that will be developed as part of this parcel not only treats the water from roofs and um, paved areas on this parcel uh, as part of the development, but from adjoining neighboring parcels that aren't owned by uh, the developer. That right now that water sheet flows into um, the, uh, the the wetlands with whatever total suspended solids, with whatever pollutants are in it, and so forth. Um, and whereas right uh, post development, all of that water, wherever it's coming from, will be treated before it gets into the wetland, and none of that is happening now. So I regard that as an improvement. I would uh, mm -hmm. add to that that I I consider that uh, we should probably be require that no salt is used um, on the newly paved areas. Um, we've done that in other ah. projects, and I think, I think that should apply here. Um, uh, in addition, the idea that 98 to 95, depending on where I draw the line, um, 
with my experiment on Google Earth of the existing tree canopy is retained. And what will be taken down to build these um, 12 units will be um, uh, largely replaced within a few years by native uh, species. And I agree with Paul, we should encourage the selection of native species to uh, be both re relatively rapidly growing, durable, and um, uh, those that transpire um, uh, more effectively. So the, the selection of some of those, and we've seen most of those, they are listed on the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the plan. So uh, I think they're already, for the most part, uh, well chosen. Um, the invasives removal, um, I think, is another plus for this parcel. Um, and the fact that the bulk of this parcel, over three acres, will be protected in perpetuity with a conservation restriction held by the city. I think all of these things represent um, a plus. Uh, it's not within the Conservation Commission uh, purview to uh, advocate for um, uh, housing, uh, in this case, relatively small, presumably entry-level housing, um, but th that's also a public good, uh, which it's not within our purview to advocate for, but um, this is something that I, I had a, a friend of mine who lives in that neighborhood say, well, you know, I always thought that building homes is pretty much a good thing. I live here. Um, I'm not against other people living here, too. Um, so um, that's a, uh, uh, a, a an ad thing, an added dimension that isn't part of our purview, but nonetheless, in terms of uh, the public good, the public good is also well served by having additional housing. Other comments, questions from commissioners? I guess I would I would just add that thank thank you Kevin that was very helpful for me to hear as well. Um, uh, I would just add that you know I I deeply feel and hear the concern about climate crisis uh, with our community yes. members. It's it's real. We know it's real, and we are in a crisis, and it's going to increasingly become a problem. Um, and balancing that with with well-planned projects or as well-planned projects as possible. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate people's uh, heartfelt and well-thought-out comments and, and feedback. And that sense of, uh, I guess I would say, lack of control. We, you know, the, I was going to attend a recent thing on climate anxiety uh, that we have. So I think the uh, order of conditions, if we can have some information specifically about uh, plants that are large, use a lot of water, uptake of uh, salix, of, of, of willows and pawpaw and others uh, would be uh, helpful. Um, and I, I also think that I don't know what we can request in terms of maintenance, uh, operations and ma management maintenance uh, in terms of the, the drainage system and making sure that that, that is well maintained. If that can be a, a condition for the HOA or how that works exactly. Um, thanks. Well, I, I, I would add, we, we normally do require the uh, uh, submission of uh, an operation and maintenance plan that then goes with the deed. Uh, so it, be, it becomes a permanent obligation mm -hmm. of, of homeowners. Um, and uh, as a condition, we then might add uh, what the frequency of inspection is to determine whether, in fact, the systems are all functioning as they should. Uh, I think in the um, staff report, Sarah suggested uh, that we look at plantings after two growing seasons and any diseased or dead uh, plants be repaired. I would prefer that after three. Um, uh, we often have done three years for other cases, and I think this we want to make sure these things are taking no pun intended, taking root uh, in a meaningful uh, and uh, durable way. Um, Does the invasive uh, species, can that be a check-in after some time as well? Because I wonder if the invasive species would, would sort of crowd out some of the new plantings. I think certainly we, if there's a clear boundary, um, like the bollards or boulders that are along the... Uh, uh, perimeter of showing beyond this is protected area um, that any uh, that we could also make that as part of the operation and maintenance plan that goes with the uh, uh, the deed 
uh, for the homeowners association and then uh, an obligation of each individual owner uh, that they and how they want to fulfill that is is whether they hire somebody uh, as an association to maintain that area within um, the boundaries of those uh, bollards as permanently free of invasives or they want to take care of it themselves um, and uh, you know at every periodic inspection uh, that we might require for the uh, rest of the system uh, that the invasives be checked as well and make sure they're not growing back. I have to imagine most homeowners don't want to have uh, invasives uh, falling <laughs> all over the place, whether that you know, the stuff I saw out there in terms of uh, bittersweet and poison ivy and multiflora rose and so forth, those wouldn't be the most popular things for homeowners to allow anyway. But uh, yes, I think we can uh, say that within the the boundary of those bollards um, that uh, invasive uh, removal and uh, maintenance uh, should be an ongoing requirement. Sarah, I'm assuming that we can do that as a condition? Yeah, that's, that's certainly something we could do within the boundaries of the 35 foot protected zone. Um, and it, you know, the applicant as part of the development and then subsequent homeowners would certainly want to make sure that bittersweet and, and some of the more pervasive plants aren't taking over their yards or isn't potentially killing their the native plants that are there. Okay, so that's an additional condition. Um, we have, uh, what's, what do you think is the reasonable frequency of inspection for the stormwater system? Um, that would be that specified in the O&M, which should be, um, I'm just looking at the DPW stormwater permit, although it will be um, amended. Um, yeah, I, think, yeah, I can't yeah. put my finger on a on an inspection frequency, but that's fairly standard for all projects with an ongoing O and M. Like biannual or annual, or uh, what's a reasonable requirement? I, I think some places they have to file an annual report. Yeah, um, annual once it's constructed. I think annual once what? Or after every major, major storm event, they have to go out and look at their <coughs> drainage structures to make sure they're performing right. And if they're filled with silt, then they have to clean those out. But that's just normally maintenance yeah. plan yeah. or storm uh, water. So we, our uh, conditions, if we include everything that's in the stormwater permit, would include inspection and maintenance schedule, uh, which was included in the, the st full stormwater drainage report uh, that would talk about inspections after major storms and how to address any issues. I see. Okay. Right. No, I forgot okay. that. The incorporation by reference is the, the DPW permit. as So we don't have to make a separate condition for that. And at the last okay. meeting, the commission had also discussed the conditions that are included in the staff report, which were, um, of course, yeah. the placement of the conservation restriction, right. um, requiring that the planting work be done prior to it concurrently with other site work. Um, let's see, we have that wasn't addressed the submittal and approval of the stormwater pollution protection plan. And uh, a, a standard condition of a stamp revised full plant set prior to the pre construction meeting, in addition to the commission standard conditions for every construction project. Right. Yeah. The, the Schedule A standard conditions goes with everything. Um, Basically, you have three sets of conditions you have hours, you have the stormwater conditions. Right. You have EP suggestions. There's a number of conditions that have to be met for this project going. Would it be um, advisable to include anything about protection of existing trees or the trees that will be remaining during construction? Yeah, that is included as a condition of the planning board permit. Okay, thanks. The, so the, the commission could repeat that, uh, but but that will need to be strictly it, okay. it, you know, prior to construction. What do you think? Want to double up on that one? Make sure that uh, 
while there's big machines running around that area, the trees are all insulated <laughs> from damage? Well, since it's such a common problem, I, I wouldn't mind having it repeated, including sure. trying to protect roots and, and Sounds good. the bark, et cetera. So we have a number of conditions there. I assume you've been capturing these, but uh, no salt on uh, this uh, uh, post development on this uh, project area. Um, uh, operation and maintenance plan, which includes not only the inspection of uh, um, uh, the stormwater system, but also the maintenance of uh, invasive street area within the area of uh, uh, defined by the project inside the bollards. Um, um, and survival of the plantings, right? Survival of the plantings for three seas, three growing seasons. Anything else that I've I've been trying to take some notes, but I don't think I've captured everything. Can we be a little more specific than survival? of the plants? Yeah, so we would require an assessment of the plantings following three growing seasons, um, and that would need to be submitted concurrently with a request for a certificate of compliance in any plants that were dead or diseased at that time would need to be replaced. And we can also add a, a assessment of the invasives within the you know, Good. 35. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's bundle that together, the invasives and the uh, new plantings both get inspected after three years. Normally it's 75% uh, okay. of the uh, planted species. We do that for wetlands replacement areas. So we want to make sure that in a case where someone's actually replicating a wetlands, that 75% of the plants are, you know, wetlands appropriate plants. But given that there's yeah. such a small number of plantings here, it, it would be appropriate to require that all of them survive. Yeah. I'd be more comfortable. Yeah, I was gonna say bring that over into the uh planting plan. Yeah. Even though it's not a wetland replacement, it makes sense. Right. Any other conditions we might want to add? If not, uh, is there a motion to uh, grant an order of conditions, including all the many things that we've talked about and incorporating uh, uh, DEB and uh, planning board uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, DPW? There was a, I say DEP because there was, they talked about their um, Stormwater Manual being incorporated as one of their recommendations. And um, that, uh, so there's additional technical specificity there from DEP. Um, so with all of those, any, any uh, I assume Sarah can capture all of that in her final version that'll uh, get uh, typed up. Um, I, I see a note from Jeff, didn't get to read it. Yeah, so uh, Jeff Squire had, had asked in the comments how the uh, the three year requirement would affect an order of conditions. So you would, Jeff, you just need to wait until after the third growing season to be able to request that certificate, which would still be within the life of the order in any case, which is common. Uh, that, yeah. that happens frequently. All right, someone want to make a motion to grant that order of condition with all of these many conditions in it? Mm -hmm. I'll make the motion. Beth uh, moves. Uh, is there a second? Second. <clears throat> By Mason. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Roll call, Cyril? Paul? Yes. Mason? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Beth? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right. Unanimous. Thank you. I, I, I want to uh, express my um, appreciation for the energy and effort that uh, so many members of the public have put into this. Um, yes. And I want to encourage that, uh, that that kind of input is is important. Like Mason said, DEP at the state level is trying to figure out how to modify the State Wetlands Act. And once that's clear, we will do something on a more local basis as well. Um, and in the meantime, if there's things like, uh, there's a lot of uh, well-articulated description of uh, this area being subject to urban heat island effects. Uh, 
Um, and so you could form a citizens group and think, about how do we get people to plant more trees in their own yards? There's a lot of open land and open yards there with no tree cover um, in that neighborhood um, that would benefit um, if there were. Uh, so please feel free to maintain the energy that you've had working toward this because uh, you know we're we're all wrestling with so how do you balance these things how do we have uh, 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 anyways it, it it's it's never simple and it's never easy but the effort you've all put in has been quite impressive and I would encourage you to continue and find ways to uh, have that effort bear fruit um, in the future with the continuing evolution of the the, the need for infill and, and additional uh, housing and the uh, protection of wetlands and uh, the mitigation of heat island effects and all of those other things that people have been talking about. Um, I, I encourage you to sustain that effort and that energy. Um, and with that, um, move on to the next case, um, which is a notice of intent for open-sided pavilion, driveway, and walkway construction within the bordering land subject to wetland. This by Grow Food Northampton on Meadow Street. Who's here to present on that? Uh, that would be me as well. Yes. Mm. I'm going to take a deep breath and just, yes, this is nice. <laughs> um, yes, Jeff Squire here on behalf of Grow Food Northampton. Um, we are, I'll share my screen. Um, this is down at the community gardens uh, off of Meadow Street. Um, just to highlight the sort of project area is right in, in this portion of the site. Um, uh, again, just occupied by lawn space. Um, there's a shed, there's a couple of sheds there now, um, you know, community garden space. Um, this is all within floodplain. Um, what they're looking to do is construct an open air pavilion in, in this space here, renovate. Uh, one of the sheds um, and essentially repave or regravel some of the walks and formalize some of the um, parking areas so that it's a little bit safer for folks to get around and through the site. Um, yeah, just as noted, you know, the entire site obviously is within floodplain. Um, there are some renovations to the shed that encompass a, a, a deck platform, you know, at the entry. Um, there are um, there are a number of posts obviously associated with the with the uh, the trellis the pergola. Um, there is you know overall um, you know given the flood uh, flood elevation on the site a total displacement in all of twenty six cubic feet of of flood water um, through that floodplain. Uh, one of the requests is that the commission you know see this as a de minimis impact on that overall floodplain area. Um, Again, all efforts being made to to make this as as flood proof and 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 resilient as possible, um, keeping grades where they are or below where they are. But the posts, obviously above above uh, above grade, essentially it's it's hard to you know we can take down a few tomato plants uh, in the fall, but uh, aside from that, there isn't much above grade that we can uh, change because of what what's there now. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's um, that summarizes the 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 permit request. Um, there are a number of um, elevations and and images of the pergola and and, and pavilion. I'd be happy to share. I'm just going to pull those up. Um, so bear with me here. Sure. Um, So can everybody see this image now, I guess, of the third girl? Oh, yeah, yeah, so these, um, Mark Sternick Architects has, has worked with Grow Food and us to develop the, these plans. Um, again, it's just an open air pavilion. Um, there are, what, six posts, I think, entirely, um, six by six posts. And so we've accounted for those. This is the renovation of the existing shed that's there. Um, largely will remain the same. There's a new deck platform that we've accounted for. Um, at the entrance, just to facilitate, um, you know, ease of of getting in and out of that shed. Um, but yeah, I think most of these plans are are pretty straightforward lighting. And but um, yeah, just an open air pavilion with some space for for gathering, and particularly, you know, in the 
um, when rain or inclement weather um, is a place for, for folks to um, do what they need to do down there. So, um, yes, yeah, some cross sections. Yeah. Is shed flood proof? What, Mason? Is the shed flood proof? <laughs> water flow. Water tight? Yeah. I mean, they're they're loose doors, so if there's flood waters, I'm sure it'll be there'll be wheelbarrows floating in the in the shed. <laughs> yes. Uh, hi there. My name is Michael Skillicorn from Grove from Northampton. Um, just to address your question, Mason, the existing shed also has openings um, a few inches above grade that are screened in, and I assume that was a condition of the original. Uh, permit when that sh structure was built, I think in 2015 or 16. Yeah, it's, a, it's sort of like a flow through valve for, for flood waters. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, the, the, the proposed shed also has that or is it on the plan? Well, that's the shed. The pavilion is by definition open. So yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But but the shed is also being renovated, right? So there it would yes. not have those anymore, right? So it, it currently oh. sort of has flow through, and then it won't. Is that no? It will. So so the shed, the only adjustment to the shed is going to be on the the roof. So the whole substructure oh, okay. and that piece of it will remain the same. I see. I see. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I I was wondering whether there was an opportunity to modify the existing sheds to make them flood through and potentially gain some flood storage that way but it sounds like they they already meet that already <laughs> okay right sounds reasonable to me and um also sounds like uh an assessment of this uh, de, de minimis displacement due to the posts um is also reasonable um we have had other occasions where you know we push the edge you get a enough posts, enough enough uh, 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 concrete cylinders to put the posts on that you start displacing many cubic feet and sometimes cubic yards, and then we get over the line, but then we start having to do uh, replacement storage. But this sounds to me like, no, nope, this is pretty minimal. We'll just have to remove the beer refrigerator from the shed, and it'll make up the difference in <laughs> six posts. <laughs> Any questions or comments from commissioners in addition to what we've had so far? Yeah. Any questions or comments from members of the public? If not, uh, is there a motion to close the hearing? So moved. I'll second, second it. Second by Paul. Um, if no further discussion, all in favor, Sarah, roll call. Right, roll call vote. Paul? Yes. Mason? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Uh, Beth? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Okay, union. This seems uh, uh, pretty straightforward um, and that uh, there was essentially no. Um, no downside uh, to the project. It's uh, I, I can't imagine that it's going to have a noticeable impact of any kind on the floodplain where where it is mapped. So, um, someone want to make a motion to grant uh, an order of condition, the order of condition. Do we need anything beside the standard condition, Sarah, on this? I I don't think so. I mean, it, typically we would document fill removed and fill added, but if if the commission is agreeing that this is a de minimis amount, those would not apply. De minimis, and it's all flat. So yeah. All right. So uh, someone want to make a motion to grant an order of condition to allow this to go forward with the standard conditions, which is a Schedule A sheet with something like sixteen standard conditions on it. I'll make a motion. Motion by Beth. Is there a second? Second. Is that, who is that, Mason? Yes. yes. Okay. Then Maiden seconded. Um, all in favor, Sarah? Paul? Yes. Mason? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Beth? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. You. 
And lastly, we have an emergency certification. Um, Sarah sent me photos about this and um, the report from DPW that uh, she also then sent out some additional photos to everybody today or recently, the last couple of days. Uh, there's risk of Route 66 collapse. Um, and it looked pretty like it. Oh, yeah, this, this, is, this is getting there. Um, I don't know how many more storms it could handle before they're going to be people coming in from the western part of town are going to be uh, unable to get here without going way around. Um, so look pretty obvious to me. Anything you want to add, Sarah? Sure. So emergency certifications, the entire commission typically doesn't get to see until they're already issued because they're by nature emergencies and need to be acted immediately uh, on immediately. But the timing of this one just worked out. So I wanted to bring it to the whole commission. Um, Put those so the, photos up? Yeah, the, yeah, I can do that. Um, and the photos don't really even convey the seriousness of the issue. Uh, where, is, um, where, where is this on 66? So this is right across from the House of Corrections. Yeah. Um, oh. The commission has granted work for um, granted emergency certifications for work here in the past. Um, so this is oh. a picture of what what's happening at the edge of the road. What this doesn't show, uh, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with those sort of like tabletop demonstrations of what happens when water gets going and hits a you know a culvert or an impediment, and then you know, you keep dumping more water into this play sand, and eventually you know it causes a a whirlpool and everything collapses. Yeah, yeah. That's essentially what's happening here, but underneath the roadway. Uh -huh. um, so it, similar to the, the bike path issue that the commission granted an order of conditions for um, earlier this spring, there's a there's a really steep drop from the uh, the manhole discharges. And that, that's causing a lot of like basically explosive force and some er, uh, serious erosion issues. So you can see where DPW in the past had set down some of this uh, mm. larger riprap as a just a measure to stop things from happening, but they're looking oh. at, at doing a bigger fix here uh, underneath the roadway by creating some drops to eliminate the the steepness of the, yes. the charges. Uh, so it's a fairly small wetland impact. Most of it is being done underneath the roadway. A little bit of temporary BBW impact in this vicinity, and some impacts to land underwater. But it, it seemed like a, a well thought out plan to hopefully address this in the long term. Um, definitely needs to happen before winter. DPW is hoping to get started with it next week. So my recommendation was just to include the construction related yep. conditions of an order within an emergency certification so that they can get this. They may find a larger hole under there when they start. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't doubt it. I think they, they initially had done some scoping of it. I don't know how recently it's been done, but it's it's definitely expanded since I went out there earlier this season. It's definitely gotten worse. Yeah, I've seen I, a I, sinkhole, sinkhole yeah, by sure. uh, catch basin where a catch basin has failed and huge sinkhole started up. Wow. Yeah. Drive a car into one. Yeah, I, I, it seems like that wouldn't be really far-fetched in this instance. No, I agree. That's, that's what it sounded like to me. Is that this is the kind of thing that if left unattended, one of these days, um, somebody's <laughs> going to be driving along and their car disappears in Route 66. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. The Versus. only question I had before going out on the site visit was, wow, they're, you know, they're reconstructing the sidewalk. Is that really something that's necessary or is it beyond the scope of... Uh, that which is necessary to abate the emergency. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense, I don't think, not to do that repair at the same time they're doing the rest of the work. The sidewalk already exists and that won't result in any additional resource area disturbance. So just getting it done all in one shot with an emergency certification yeah. seemed like an appropriate way to respond to this. I agree. It makes sense because you're only gonna be disturbing the area by construction once rather than- yeah. So what kind of vote do we need, Sarah, for, for this emergency Uh So we could, uh, you could vote to grant the emergency certification uh, with the construction related conditions of an order and anything else you think might be appropriate in, in this case. Um, looks pretty straightforward to me. Uh, if anybody has additional conditions to propose, then uh, speak up. Uh, Otherwise, I'd say uh, take Sarah's phrasing and have a motion to grant 
uh, a certification of emergency um, uh, emergency certification um, uh, to proceed with the work as soon as possible. I would move that we do that. Motion made, second. I'll second. Second by Beth. Um, all in favor, Sarah? Okay. Roll call vote, Paul? Uh, yes. Mason? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Beth? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Okay. Unanimous. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah. the, uh, you fed the dog. <laughs> hang on just a second. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, oh. We were, we, 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 we both had meetings tonight, so it wasn't clear who fed the dogs. But anyway, <laughs> <Yeah. so. laughs> um. All right. Anything else? Anybody? No. I think so I I believe we will have a meeting on October tenth. There are a few permits that are pending action by other agencies or applicants. So I'm not entirely sure, but I'm I'm fairly sure. And we also, um, I was going to do it today, but I assume this would be a long meeting and didn't want to add yeah. something to it. We'll have um, an executive session regarding uh, potential land acquisitions as well. Oh, great. Okay. Well, and I'll add my compliments to everybody on the commission. This was an especially voluminous amount of material to <laughs> try and digest. Um, and uh, well, it's in the know, foreign uh, language, too. <laughs> not, not too many people understand range calculations. No, uh, that's right. <laughs> and those of us who work with them, it's, yes. it's oh. a difficult thing to grasp sometimes. Yep. All um, right. For, for, for many years, I have relied on Mason to interpret that language for me. So, <laughs> all right, everybody. Good to see you all. Thanks yes. again. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, this thank has you. been a lot thanks, of work Sarah. for you going through all of this, but thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. All right. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.